I'm going to treat this like any other Sunday. Although it seems so strange to look on this side and not see my familiar faces. I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 3 as we work our way through the book of Philippians. The first 11 verses of the chapter, the Apostle Paul writes this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous. But for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yet doubtless I count all things but for but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for this portion of scripture this morning. I pray that the Holy Spirit would allow me to give justice to this portion this morning, for again, it's important that every word of your Bible is important. Father, I pray that we would have open and receptive hearts this morning to your word. And I pray that also that we'd have open hearts of compassion for those of our church family under the weather today and in need, that we would lift them up continually in prayer. And I ask now, Father, that we would be attentive to your word, that it would move us and change us from the inside out, that we would be closer to you and would walk a more narrow path as we head to that city whose streets are paved with gold. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, what a wonderful way to start a portion of Scripture, isn't it? Rejoice in the Lord. You know, Paul talks about that a lot, rejoicing. That's what I, one of the things I heard earlier this morning. We're few in number. That's okay. We can still rejoice in the Lord. We can still have a wonderful time. You know, believers should always rejoice in the Lord because He's given us so much and what He gives is eternal. That's so important for us. I want you to take a second and I want you to think of all the worldly things, all those things that you rejoice in, all those things you take joy in and think about the fact that every one of those things going to pass away. Every one of them. Our only true rejoicing should be in the Lord Jesus Christ. The most important thing for anyone and the only thing that really matters is what you do with Jesus Christ. You know, the world's in a bad shape out there. We know that. What the world needs is not more laws, not more rules, not more regulation. The world needs Jesus. If the world would come to Jesus Christ for salvation, there would be a rejoicing in the world. It would be unbelievable, wouldn't it? But we're going to have to wait on that a little bit. But we can continue to pray for folks. You know, without Jesus Christ, we have nothing to rejoice in. Be honest. Now, what would you have to rejoice in if you didn't have Jesus? I've got a big home, I've got a nice car, I've got money in the bank, but my eternal soul is damned. What do you have to be rejoicing in? I know that old sin nature says, take joy in this thing or that thing and hold on to it tight, but it's only temporary. As I say, all those things that we hold so important that we rejoice in, 
one day be destroyed or belong to someone else. You can't take worldly things with you when the Lord calls you home. Now there's old stories about people wanting things buried with them. Well, all you're doing is put them in the ground. But you can take Jesus with you. That's what's important. So with rejoicing in the Lord in mind, Paul says, beware of dogs. So this is a strange statement. You have to understand that <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> there's a common practice for most of the Jews to refer to the Gentiles in those days as dogs or unclean animals. That's basically what it refers to. But then that's it. A Gentile is unclean. Now when we talk about Gentile scripture, when the Old Testament, Israel, they were the people of God. The Gentile was the world. They were the dogs. They were lost. You know, some people still call us today Gentiles. But I'm going to tell you something. When you come to Jesus Christ, you're not a Gentile anymore. You belong to Him. You have to separate what people think. And it's wonderful. So Paul says, remember to beware of dogs. But here, Paul's making a reference to the Jews who uh, mutilated the gospel by inserting the need to mutilate the flesh in order to be saved. Remember, that's one of the battles that they had early in the early church. You go over to Acts, and they, they need them to be circumcised to be saved. But that's, you know, people need to understand that circumcision was part of the covenant with Israel, not the church. And even though their, attention, their intentions may have been good, or maybe they weren't, but their actions were actually evil. Because what are you doing? You're adding to the word, or you're trying to take away from the word, and that can't happen. They were attempting to add works to salvation. And that still happens today. Adding works. It's been going on since day one. Oh, how people love to do that, don't they? It makes them feel important, I guess, as if they have some power to assist in their salvation. But, you know, for my grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. You know? Forget about water baptism. Forget about circumcision. All those things focus on the flesh. All those things are works. I don't care what you... you know, we, yes, we do water baptism, but it's in the uh, church ordinance. You're making a statement to the world. I've already accepted Jesus Christ. I'm identified Him with His death, burial, and resurrection. It has nothing to do with your salvation. If you're saved today and you're never baptized... With water, you're still saved because you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Don't let people try to add works to your salvation. What that does is steal your joy. Well, if you didn't do this or you didn't do that, you're saved. It's God's gift. Our faith that God does the work. His grace, His unmerited favor. So the warning of beware of dogs is an important warning for us because we need to beware of anything or anyone that this world or of this world that can take your focus off of Jesus Christ. They want to take the, their, your focus off the completed work of the cross and the resurrection. They want to say, add to this, add to that. What Jesus did was not enough. Jesus did everything needed to be done. Those works for salvation, folks, and those people who say you can lose your salvation, those false teachers like that, they will do anything they can to steal your joy. That's the reason Paul began, rejoice in the Lord. See, they're tempting. They want you to walk around on eggshells. That's, that's what they want. You see, they say, well, I'm miserable. They really don't believe anyway. They want you to be miserable. So you better be careful. If you do this, you lose your salvation. Well, I don't know how many times I've said this over the years. Here's a sad statement. If you can lose your salvation, how do you get it back? I have never read anywhere in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says how you can be saved again. Why? Because once you're saved, you're always saved. There's no need to go back a second time. So there's also a warning to be aware of anything which can divert you from having Christ at the center of your life. If Jesus is not the center of your life, your life is out of balance. You're going to be bumping here. You're going to be bumping there. Things just not going to work out for you. And if He's not the center of your life, then you can easily be attacked 
by those dogs. Beware of the dogs. If you don't have Christ in the center, then you may not be walking as you should. You're not reading the Bible as you should. And I'm going to tell you what, those dogs will attack, and there are a great number of dogs in the world today, just as it was 2,000 years ago. As a matter of fact, these dogs are more like a pack of wolves. Sometimes people, and other times it's things, but they are vicious animals, and they will attack you, and they will attempt to rip you to shreds. Not physically, spiritually. They're trying to do anything they can to pull your faith away from Jesus, to try to get your mind off of Him, to focus on the things of the world. And there's one who's behind these attacks. The prince of the power of the air, Satan. You know, there's only two sides of the coin. Did you ever realize that? You either are for Jesus or you're against Him. If you belong to Jesus, you're in one category. If you don't, who's your ruler? Well, I've, your ruler's the devil. There's no other way of saying it. It's either black or white. You know, and how does the Bible describe the devil? Over in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is a wild animal and he wants to devour anyone he can. He's just like the dogs. He wants to attack. He wants to destroy. So Paul continues by giving another warning. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concision. Concision means cutting off and here it refers to those of circumcision. So what's he talking about? Beware of the Judaizers. That's what he's talking about here. The evil workers and beware of the Judaizers. We talked about just a moment ago. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to be circumcised. Today we see those evil workers who are opposed to anything and everything to do with the truth of Scripture. These are the people, if you say, in the beginning, God, they'll say there is no God. Or they'll say, well, it took him 10 billion years when it took him six days. You know, they're dedicated to their purpose. And they'll come knocking on your door and they're going to attempt to get you to fall for their lies. Yeah, I said lies. I'm not politically correct. I just tell it like it is. They will cloak their lies and the right sounding words. You know, they, they take pride in the fact that they can take biblical words, words that we use, and we know what they mean, and they bend them around so that you think that they're talking about the same thing that we believe in. But if you dig a little deeper, you know it's not even close. That's why we need to be aware of all false teaching by being prepared to defend the truth. How do we defend the truth of the Bible? We have to read and study it. A Bible that sits on the coffee table and gets dusty is no good. A Bible that's left in the car or in the church pew or any place else is of no use to you. How are you going to read a Bible that's not with you? I've opened Bibles that people say, it's my favorite Bible. And you open it and the spine cracks. It's never been opened before. Is it your favorite Bible because they like the way it looks? It's what's inside. You need to know that. The Bible is God's Word. It needs to be heard daily, daily. It's God speaking to you. And you know what? If every one of us in here would take one passage and we would read that one passage, God would say something different to each and every one of us. The meaning would might still be the same, but He's telling us something different. It's The Word's alive. So whenever we're told to beware, it means that, oh, well, get ready. Get your toes stomped on. It means that we are not following closely the leading and direction of the Holy Spirit. Beware. You know, if the Bible says beware, it's like they're doing it. You're not paying attention to evil workers. You're not paying any attention to this or that. Beware. You need to open your spiritual ears and listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Those, these people that come today, they're as subtle as that serpent in Eden. Oh, he was more subtle than any animal in the garden. And that's the way they are today. We would probably say today that they're stealth. You don't see them coming. They're just there on top of you. Kind of reminds me of what's written in Jude 4. 
For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and our Lord, only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way these evil men come in. They sneak in and they attack even before you're aware of it. You need to be prepared and ready to defend the cause of Christ. You have to. You have to be able to know what the Bible says. Not many years ago, well, it may have been a lot of years ago. Now time kind of slips away. We had a fellow come back who'd been raised in the church and he had got, he was a Calvinist. And he was very subtle at how he began to work person on person, trying to get them to come over to his side. And he finally, he said something to me and we had it out and he left. We could not let him continue sneaking in and diverting the truth of Scripture. So we need to be prepared to defend the faith. Verse 3 says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The Old Testament rite of physical circumcision was not only a sign of the covenant relationship between Israel and the Lord, and was not to the church, not at all. You know, people have a problem with identifying what belongs to Israel and what belongs to the church. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people say, I want to be Israel. Well, you know what? I want to be part of the church. It's so much better. But it was given to them. But there's something you need to see. It's intended also to be related to the spiritual circumcision of the heart when you come to Jesus Christ. God actually talked about this all the way back in Deuteronomy. Over in Deuteronomy 36. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, that thou may livest. Even back then, as Moses is writing these words from God, he is pointing us to the fact that one day the circumcision will be of the heart. He's pointing us to the time of Jesus Christ and beyond. So here, while Paul is, of course, writing to Gentiles, he's making it clear that he and, and they, speaking of born-again believers here, were not under true circumcision, but they were true, but not of the flesh, but of the heart. That's why Paul says after that, that we are to worship God in spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ. We worship him in spirit because it's no longer a physical thing. It's no longer under the law. As you notice again, rejoice. Paul, Paul just could not hold himself down. From the time he met the Lord and came to the realization that it was true, he rejoiced. Instead of boasting in human accomplishments, as the Judaizers did and some of the Jews did, a, a child of God should glory in Jesus Christ alone. After all, what do we have to boast about in our own life? The pit pitiful deeds of the flesh. You know, we, sometimes you think about, well, I did this, and, and a lot of times it's about sports or whatever you did, but it's nothing, isn't it, when you think about it? After all, what do we really have to boast about? Nothing. It's a fact that in his past, before his salvation, Paul had been prone to boast about everything. He had so much external privilege in his life that he thought he was well out in front of any of his companions, of anybody else in Israel. You know, there were four things, four special, four special things that he talked about that set him, he thought set him above everyone else before he found Jesus Christ. First, he was born of Orthodox parents. Circumcised as the law required on the eighth day. My parents brought me up strict. They brought me up according to the law. Secondly, he was the, of the stock of Israel. More precisely, I'm an Israelite by race. See, he was not just of the people of Israel because proselytes could be considered and called people of Israel. The word that Paul used here is genus in Greek, and it means family, race, or kind. He is speaking of blood descent. 
and his pride. He took great pride in the fact that he was of the stock of Israel. My blood is of Israel. I can trace my blood back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thirdly, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. This was a matter of special pride for him. You know, the priests had to prove their lineage. And the father of any girl who was to marry a priest had to prove that he was an Israelite by lineage at least for three generations. Tribal identifications by this time had become blurred because of the... Well, they're just all over the world now. And it's, it was just uh, people just... Well, I think I'm from this tribe or that tribe. But the tribe of Benjamin was one of the two southern tribes that existed actually and remained true to the house of David and to Jerusalem being the center of worship for Israel. And possibly Paul's parents had given him the name Saul in honor of the first king of Israel, who was a Benjamite, King Saul. And finally, the fourth thing we see, Paul crowned all of his list of privileges of what to boast about by claiming to be a Hebrew of the Hebrews. This had a very special meaning. You know, the Jews were dispersed all over the world. I just see it there. And they're going to be dispersed even farther in 70 AD. Ten, tens of thousands were in Rome. Alexandria had more than a million. Most of those Jews had stubbornly refused to give up their religion. They, they were not going to be assimilated into the nations. They kept their traditions, their customs, their laws. But there was one thing that most of them did do. They adopted the language of the people who were dominant around them. And they forgot their Hebrew. A Hebrew was not merely a Jew. He was a Jew who with great effort and difficult discipline retained the Hebrew language. And he taught it to his children. See what Paul's talking about here? Paul says, I used to claim not only to be a full-blooded Jew, I was a Hebrew who learned and never forgot my language. Even though he was born in a Gentile city, even though he was born of, of Tarsus, he never gave it up. So he took so much pride in what he was. He took pride in being Jewish. And he wanted everybody to know it. And as to prove his point, he adds concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul had been a dedicated law keeper, even though there was no way for him to keep the law. Did Paul keep the law? Nope. Did he try? Yeah. He attempted to keep Judaism protected by Christianity, as he saw it, by persecuting the church. That's what made him one of the great missionaries of all time. Because when you look at Paul, who has such a zeal to destroy the church, and after he met Jesus, that zeal changed. He wanted to see Israel saved. He wanted to see Gentiles saved. His life was just so different. He flipped around. What a witness that is. Matter of fact, early on, you remember that people didn't trust Paul. Christians said, I don't know about him. He might be up to no good. But what a powerful witness it is to go from one extreme to the other. See, that was Paul's background. And that was his reasons for once being so proud and bragging about everything that he did. But all that changed on the road to Damascus. And once he was saved, he came to the realization that, as we all should, by the way, that what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. How shocking that must have been for Paul. How humbling it was to finally come to the realization that all those things that the world looks at as so important were nothing. They were worthless without salvation in Jesus Christ. All those prideful things you thought were so important are actually nothing when we open our spiritual eyes and see what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us and what we should be doing for Him. Verse 8, I think, actually really demonstrates the heart of the Apostle Paul. Yet doubtless, and I count all things, but for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. How important were those things Paul boasted about? They were nothing. 
They were worthless. They were a stench in the nostrils of God. They were dung to me. They were nothing. They were trash. They were wrecked. Oh, it's awful. But what became important for Paul is that I may win Christ. Verse 9 says that I may be found in Him not having my own righteousness. Therefore, it's important for us to remember that it is not my own righteousness because we don't have any. They're none righteous. No, not one. I was like Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as unclean things and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. How filthy are those rags? Anybody ever explain that to you? When they would make a caravan journey across the desert, it might take them a week, might take them 10 days. Their undergarments were never changed. That's the filthy rags he's talking about. That's what our righteousness are. Can you imagine? That's what God sees our righteousness. There's no pretty way of saying it, is it? They stink. You see, here again we see the difference between the world and the Lord, between the flesh and the spirit. The world will tell you that all those external things are so important and they're so valuable. Christians, what's important is what has happened and what is happening in your heart and in you. What you are and what you do for the Lord. That's what's important. For the Lord, not for yourself, but for the Lord. Salvation is found in Christ Jesus and there's no other way available to find salvation and I don't care what the false teachers and the false prophets try to tell you, I'll go by the Word of God. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That ends the whole conversation. It's Jesus or it's nothing. And Paul says in verse 9, not having my own righteousness, we don't have any, which is of the law, we can't keep the law even if we're under the law. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that is salvation. That's the only way we can be righteous is to come to Jesus Christ. So Paul at this point in his life chose not to boast about anything except what Christ has done for him. You know, Paul could say so much he had done so much, but he realizes now it's all about Christ. And everything that's happening, it's all from God. You know, we boast in our accomplishments because of the self-centeredness and pride found in our old sin nature. Everybody enjoys being patted on the back and being told how wonderful they are and how great their accomplishments have been. But this is only the me, 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 look at me attitude of the world. There was a fellow that we used to know. We used to ride motorcycles with him occasionally. And every time I would see him, he would boast about how many people he led to the Lord. Every time he told me about the multitudes he had led to the Lord that past week, and I would just kind of stand back and listen. And my experience told me that this wasn't going to happen. That the number of people he claimed that he had led to the Lord were actually true, everybody in the valley would be saved. But I realized after a while that he loved to boast about what he did and not what the Lord was doing. It was all about him. Me, me, me. Look what I did. You know, I would rather have somebody tell me I led one person to the Lord and he really comes than somebody, I led 5,000 and none of them were saved. When you say that, you're doing it for yourself. Look at me. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in the world and enjoy the praise of men. You know, we're not to glory in what we've done, but whether we are to rejoice in the Lord and what He is accomplishing, and when He accomplishes through us, well, we have a right and proper heart. Here's another important for us point for us to take hold of. Privileges of birth, human achievement, I don't care how noble it is, count for nothing. How often do you hear somebody say, well, mom and dad were Christian, so I'm a Christian? No, it doesn't work that way. Or I've been going to church all my life, and it doesn't matter. You have to make that commitment. 
Everything we do in the flesh for our own glory is rubbish before God. There are many things who, there are many who deserve to have, they really want a, a list of do's and don'ts. They really desire that. And they, uh, they equate these do's and don'ts with righteousness. But righteousness, which is of the law, is a little deceptive, isn't it? It's short-lived. Now you have it. Now you don't. Remember, the law was never given to bring salvation. The law was given to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Jesus Christ. You know, it's dependent upon your efforts at meeting obligations, keeping laws, doing right, at least what you consider right or wrong. Not necessarily how the Bible describes it. That's how these people who, who want to live under some rules act. But the righteousness of God is conferred upon us by God in response to our faith in Jesus Christ. To many of us Christians, we have to take hold of this freedom bringing, wing giving truth. You know, once we realize that this is of God, not of us, give ourselves to Him, we're free. We're absolutely free. Many, keep, many people try to keep one foot in the law domain where doing prevails, hoping that their doing will lead to righteousness or perhaps more righteousness. How do you, how do you be more righteous? If you ever try to figure that one, well, I want to be more righteous than the righteous comes from Jesus Christ. Because as a believer, you have the Spirit, you are to live in the Spirit. You know, don't forget, you do not strive to live by the world. You strive to live by the Spirit. And you have to be in the Spirit. Just the opposite of what the world wants. And because we've been conferred the righteousness of God, we do the deeds of righteousness. I'm not talking about working your salvation, but salvation that works, as James talks about. Once you're saved, you should have a desire to serve the Lord. Believers do righteous works not to get some wonderful reward or not to get in the right relationship with God because we've already been justified. We're not trying to work to get anything more. We're working because we love Him. We're in the right relationship with God by faith. Our righteousness is that which is through faith in Christ Jesus. And a question now. Here's the important point that's made in this passage how each and every believer may know Christ. This is an important point as we finish up here. It seems that phrase after phrase that Paul used here demonstrates knowing Christ is the core of what really matters. It's the center. In verse 7, things. I counted loss for Christ. In verse 8, for excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them as dung, that I may win Christ. In verse 9, he says, be found in Him. Verse 10, that I may know Him. There it is. What does it mean to know Christ? As usual, the Bible contains the answer. Don't stop reading. Verse 10 contains the question by telling us the power of His resurrection that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. This is what Paul's talking about. See, everything, something has to click in you to make it all real with you. To know Christ is to have His resurrection power in us. At conversion, you know, we, we come to the Lord, we repent, and we make that faithful commitment where we, we're united with Christ. God does something which we accept by faith. Once accepted, this becomes a fact of experience. We must now come to know Him in whom we now live. We say, well, I came to Jesus. You know who He is and you believe in who He is, but do you know Him? See, it has to become real. Oh, we must now come to know Him. The suffering, death, and resurrection tell the story of Jesus' life. But knowing Christ is not simply knowing about His suffering, His death, His resurrection, as just events in the gospel. Many people, and even talking about Christians, they know the events of Jesus' life. They know some of the events that happen in the Bible. That's head knowledge. But 
it's knowing the dimensions of Christ's life as present and active forces in our lives. That's what makes it real to us. So it's not by chance that Paul begins with the power of his resurrection. We must be convinced that Christ's resurrection and the rise to a new life in God's new creation, we have to understand that and completely accept it before we can learn the secret of Christ's suffering and be conformed to his death. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Okay, here we go. How do we know Christ? The power of the resurrection. Okay, we just talked about that a little bit. We can know the power of Jesus' resurrection. Every day we are all new creatures in Christ Jesus. And every moment is new. Every moment's exciting time that we can serve and worship the Lord. We need to understand as we live each day for Him that it's no longer our power, but we are to let the power of the Lord overtake us in our lives and to lead us, to guide us and direct us. This should be the experience for a Christian who knows the power of Christ's resurrection. You believe, you know, you can close your eyes, you can see the unoccupied tomb. You can see Jesus talking to Mary. You can see Jesus alive. You can see Jesus as clearly in your heart as Paul did on the road to Damascus. Once you have grasped the power of the resurrection, the second thing we need to see is the fellowship of His suffering. Boy, this is a harsh, hard, difficult, demanding, but it's the essential truth. There's absolutely no way we can completely know Christ until we know Him in the fellowship of His suffering. There was a book written a number of years ago, uh, Go Out in Joy. It was a story of uh, Nina Herman. She was a chaplain at a woman's hospital. Every day she worked with children who were dying and sick and just ongoing suffering. And there was always a question that would pop up in her mind. How can a loving, caring God allow this to happen? And she would push that in her, back in her mind and go along because she had tried to help these children because of her compassion. But... When the day was over, she would go home to her apartment. That question would always come back to her mind. Why does God allow this? I can't understand it. Where is God in all this, she would say. One very cold and snowy evening, she was sitting in front of her fireplace, snuggled up reading a book. She was trying to keep that thought out of her mind. The phone rang. It was the mother of a former patient. They had readmitted her daughter to that hospital and she begged Nina Herman to come to the hospital at once. This wasn't a new experience. This happened several times and each and every time that this happened, it had been a false alarm. The weather that night was, I said, extremely cold and brutal. The wind was howling. Oh, the warm fire and the comfort of her chair. Oh, she, she tried to put it off. She said, can we do it the next day? But the... The mother just kept on and on. Even though she wanted to stay home, she said yes. She wrapped up and headed out in the snow and the wind, walked to the hospital. <clears throat> when she got there, just as she thought, it was another false alarm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Instead of returning home immediately, though, she sat down to talk with the mother. And the conversation, something happened. The cross and Christ's suffering finally hit home. The meaning clicked. All of a sudden, it made sense to her. It made sense to the mother also. And said, as a result of the conversation, the mother received new hope and, and courage for her ordeal. Nina Herman wrote that her discovery <clears throat> of this. I had read about God and Jesus participating in human experiences participating in suffering, knowing rejection, knowing loneliness and pain, knowing anger. I had read it, but it had never been a revelation until now. And that's a significant point of her story. She had received this revelation by following her conscience, 
doing what she determined was her duty. Reading about these problems is vital, but alone it's not enough, she said. Meditation on written words is good, but alone it is not enough. Do when you don't want to go. Do. Go when you don't want to go. Plod through the snow. Wrestle with the wind and the cold. Go when you don't want to go. And when you least expect, you may glimpse through an open door of revelation. See, the fellowship of suffering has special meaning also for our prayer life. Why don't we see the suffering in the world? We don't go. We don't look. But if you want you to see it, once you understand it, accepting the fact that we are raised to newness in the life of Christ, with Christ, we celebrate the liberating power of the resurrection through praise and thanksgiving. Along with our prayers of rejoicing and gratitude, we link intercession for those who suffer, who have not experienced the wholeness through forgiveness or healing. We, we pray for those people. And I certainly hope that when you pray, you pray rejoicing and you give thanks. And I know that we pray one for another. And, and the more you associate with the suffering of others, the more your heart can be opened to pray for them. Intercession is difficult work. Somehow, and who can tell us how, our task is to cultivate awareness and become so sensitive to the suffering of others in prayer and to the degree possible in our action, we take upon ourselves their suffering. You see where we're coming here now. When we do these things, we're coming full circle. We're beginning to be more, more Christ-like. We're beginning to understand the suffering of Christ. Instead of keeping the pain away from us, loving prayer leads us into suffering of the Lord and of others. Yeah. The deeper our love for God, the deeper our love is going to be for others. And the more we suffer, the more we will pray. Sounds interesting. The more we suffer, the more we pray. Think about your life. Make it personal. Was there a time when you were sick? Was your prayer life stronger? The time you were hurt? Was your prayer life stronger? When you were going through those... Wasn't your prayer life stronger? Didn't you come to the Lord more? If we understand the suffering of others, we take it upon ourselves as Christ did, then our prayer life is really going to be strengthened. And our suffering and the suffering of others is embraced by a very compassionate and loving Jesus Christ. In a way that we may never fully understand our intercession through identity with suffering becomes a channel of Christ's liberating power. You know, people say, well, God knows what's going to happen. Yes, He does. Then how can my prayer change that? He's God. You remember several years back, that tornado that came through New Orleans just destroyed, almost destroyed the city. Another was heading the same way. You remember the meteorologist, there's nothing that's going to change it. The prayer of people changed that hurricane. God changed that by prayer. Have you ever been healed? By prayer. The third thing about knowing Christ means <clears throat> being conformed to His death. Here's another reoccurring theme for Paul from Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Colossians 3.3 For ye are dead and your life is hid with God, Christ in God. Paul means more than knowing Christ through the fellowship of His suffering. The Christian is to die to the old nature. Romans 6, 5 says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall also in the likeness of His resurrection. Galatians 6, 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You see, the Christians have to die to that old self. We must pass through death to life. We must yield. You know, he yielded his life in the process of so we can let that old die and the new man be born. We'll be born again. Isn't that wonderful? I always get upset. You see bumper stickers a lot. I was born okay the first time. No, you weren't. He must be born again. 
there's a sense in which knowing Christ and the power of His resurrection and being conformed to His death is one big dynamic process. And His death and resurrection, the old humanity, that old Adamic nature, came to an end and a new humanity began. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. And just represented dying and, and rising of Christ, we pass through the death and resurrection of the old Adam. The implication of this must be lived out, however. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. And for resurrection from the dead. Paul doesn't stop with what really matters in this life. Knowing Christ means that life goes on beyond physical death. There's more to life than this world. Praise the Lord for that. It's eternal. By the power of Christ's resurrection, each and every believer will be resurrected and live eternally. Oh, what a wonderful day that will be. The resurrection is real. And the power of the resurrection which allows us to live with joy and security is real. And once we grasp hold of these things, once they become true to you, once they become living in you, then you know Christ. There's so many Christians, I'm telling you, it's the truth, they don't know Jesus. They're saved, yes, I'm not down to salvation, but they don't know Him because everything in the Gospel isn't true to them. They're not living it. But we're going to live forever. You know, death doesn't end this life. Even the unbelievers, the lost, they die physically, but they exist forever. I don't like to say they live forever. I think exist is a better word because where they're going to be existing is not life, but hell. This world, when you leave this world, doesn't end it, as so many people teach. And being a believer, grasping on to knowing Christ means that we have eternal life. Eternal is a long time. May we pray. Father, I thank You for this passage of Scripture this morning, and I thank You for those who have come out. I pray that this message has touched hearts, and I hope it really means something to them that they can grow in You. I do want to ask prayer for our church family today. So many of them are sick and under the weather. I want to pray for Norma and June, Henry and Linda, and Danny and Teresa, Clarence and Elizabeth. I don't know how many others might be under the weather now and recovering, working their lives. And be with us, Father, to grow and know You, to know Jesus Christ. That the things we read in Scripture are just not a story to us, but they're real and working in our hearts. Thank You, Lord. And I pray that Your Holy Spirit is working in a mighty way. As we leave this morning, I pray your blessing upon us, your guidance and direction. Pray that we would be back at the next appointed time and that you would allow us to be wonderful witnesses for you in all that we say and more importantly, how we live our life. For it's in that wonderful name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.